Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Jasmine Ballroom at Black Hat 2015. A couple quick announcements. There's a reception tonight in Business Hall, which is also known as the Shoreline A Room. That reception begins at 5.30 p.m. Then the Pony Awards begin at in the Mandalay Bay BCD Room at 6.30 p.m. I know we've been saying 6 o'clock for a long time. Somebody came and told us about an hour ago, no, it's actually 6.30. So if you're going to be there at 6, you'll be there early. You're, again, in the Jasmine Room, and you're here to see, hopefully, the little, gas, little pump gauge that could attacks on gas pump monitoring systems. Uh, your speakers will be Cal Vilholt and Stephen Hilt. And thank you very much. And hopefully you can also, if you have cell phones that aren't on vibrate, change that, please. Thank you. How's it going, everyone? I'm uh, Stephen Hilt. I'm a senior threat researcher at Trend Micro. And I am Kai Wilhoyd, also a senior threat researcher. <clears throat> so I realize we're standing in... I broke it. That might be a fire hazard. Um, I realize we're standing in front of everybody getting beer, so we're going to get through this all together. Um, if anybody feels like bringing beer up to the stage, we're more than happy to accept that gratefully. And we will also return the favor after the talk, so keep that in mind. Um, again, so today what we're going to be talking about is primarily uh, focusing on attacks around pump monitoring systems. And the pump monitoring systems we're going to be discussing is gasoline pump monitoring systems. Prior to really kind of getting into the actual systems themselves and kind of looking at the profiles and the vulnerabilities behind the systems, what we're really going to be looking at first is kind of where the industry is. And by industry, I'm using quotations because I hate when that term is used. I hate when everyone says, well, we're the industry. and we're, I, That's all crap. So what we're going to be discussing is kind of where ICS, uh, the ICS environment is and kind of where we've seen it progress over the past four years, realistically. Just to give you some context about why the research that we've performed over the past six months kind of came about. So first, threats around SCADA and ICS environments started to adapt and change. We started to see targeted attackers, and by targeted attackers, I'm referring to the ever-hated term APT, and state-sponsored attackers, primarily looking at these devices and looking at these environments, right? They're trying to look at these devices for multiple reasons that we'll kind of go into um, here shortly. These threats started to be looked at a little bit more in depth for multiple reasons and at a larger scale. And we started to realize that starting in about 2010, and it slowly started to ramp up after more research has come about, uh, more data has come about regarding some of these threats and some of these vulnerabilities that exist. SCADA data and information around SCADA environments also started to trade in underground forums. This was an interesting scenario that we started to watch occur because traditionally, whenever we're on underground forums and we're looking for new banking trojans, we're looking for new rats, these types of things, we started to see SCADA information and interest in SCADA information start popping up. And for instance, this particular individual was looking specifically for a SCADA rat. It's pretty generic and pretty, uh, uh, this tells me kind of the knowledge level of this specific individual at this point. But nonetheless, that interest level is there, and it's only continuing to get further and deeper. Vulnerabilities also continued uh, to, to arise and continued to come about. These vulnerabilities not only existed in ICS and SCADA devices themselves, but also in the communications protocols that are occurring between these devices, as well as the way in which these services and technologies were utilized. We started to watch this obviously gain prominence in 2009, 2010. And again, as is the trend with all of these types of environments, the trend is going upward. This slide is taken from ICS CERT, uh, the kind of the responsible body in the United States for handling critical infrastructure incidents and, and other things related to SCADA environments. This slide is intended for one thing, and that's to show that incidents are happening, right? I'm not going to get into great detail as to what these particular details are, what classifies as an incident, because that's something that has been up for great debate, specifically about these charts that are generated. So I'm not going to get into that. Nonetheless, we can see that incidents are occurring, and primarily the two specific sectors being critical manufacturing and energy, which accounted for over 50% of the incident counts. 
That's somewhat staggering, right? And it starts to stagger out from there, from communications all the way down to government facilities, et cetera. Scale of vulnerabilities and incidents per year started to increase at a fairly high rate. So you can see, we charted it out from 2011 all the way to 2014. We're not including 2015 statistical information yet, primarily because all of that information hasn't been brought to attention yet and it hasn't been fully released yet. So we started in 2011 with 138 vulnerabilities. That's a rough count, but nonetheless, there was 138. And it started to go up and start to dip back down, but the incidents are also starting in an upward trend. So again, there's more attention being paid to these devices, there's more attention being paid to exposing vulnerabilities in these environments and devices, as well as looking at those particular protocols. So a question that we're often asked whenever we're discussing SCADA environments is, why are these environments attacked? What is the benefit? Who does the attacking? The first is the government. <laughs> Yeah, that one's awesome. Um, and by, by the government, I'm not referring to the US government, and I'm not referring to a specific government in general. What I'm referring to is governmental entities oftentimes will like to look at these environments for obvious reasons. They like to obviously assess critical infrastructure of a specific nation state, not only to possibly pre-target uh, future engagements that may occur, but also in some cases they're looking, they're looking for statistical information about an environment for a competitive advantage. And I'm not going to mention any nation states here, but I think there's probably a few that come up in most of our minds. So the government is one of the primary offenders of looking at SCADA environments and actively targeting and attacking them. Also criminals. We're starting to see criminals take a big notice in these specific environments. The big question with that is why, right? One of the big reasons as to why criminals are looking at this is because it gives them an opportunity to build up their, for lack of a better term, their credentials. They can go out on underground forums, get repped for attacking or bringing down devices, prove it with logs, prove it with additional information, and that builds up their reputation to then be able to get access to other closed forums, to get access to other information that they may not have elsewhere. In addition, we've watched a lot of specific Windows environments, primarily, uh, that are functioning as HMIs or human machine interfaces, that criminals are actually compromising to then add into their botnet. And in this case, these particular individuals don't even give a shit that they're on an HMI. They couldn't care any less often times. They're out there literally just to add one more box to their environment to then laterally move inside that network. And the reason that they're going out and compromising it is because it's easy. And whenever I say that, I mean these devices are almost always non-patched. They're almost always using antiquated software, antiquated hardware. And these are all things that we've always heard about, right? I mean, we're talking, this is not uncommon. We're talking Windows XP machines, Windows Server 2008 instances that haven't been patched for years. So those are some of the reasons that SCADA is being attacked still to this day, and it's still continuing to go forward. So now that we've kind of wrapped up kind of an industry overview, we're gonna now start to look at the actual research that we've performed uh, regarding the actual Guardian AST pumps. I don't know what you're thinking is, what did anything Kyle just have to say have to do with the title of this slide, um, of this presentation? So we're going to talk about specifically the Guardian ASTs. Guardian AST is a device that's deployed for tank monitoring. The tanks themselves tend to be the underground tanks that you find at gas stations, and this will help you determine the volume, temperature, water content other things about the tank as well. Delivery reports, shift reports, those things as well are built into it. Uh, so these usually are at gas stations, and next time you look, the next time you're at a gas station, you'll we'll likely probably see one of these at the gas station. Look behind the counter. Yeah, they're you'll usually behind the counters. So what happens here is uh, kind of a diagram of how this system works. These Guardian AST devices sit at the gas stations themselves, and then you have your supplier, who is usually a terminal station, that deploys the product to the individual gas stations. So when somebody's running low, this system, they're going to query it, and it'll tell them that the tank is getting low, and then they will de deploy the gas product, gasoline, diesel, biofuels, or whatever, uh, to the place that needs it. 
Uh, a lot of times this is done more in a manual approach where there's behind the counter, somebody's looking at it and determining it and making that call. But in a lot of cases, this is also becoming more and more prevalent that this is automated, where somebody's doing automated queries of these systems, which is why you're finding these online. And in fact, we have a short little video here. How do I do this now that it's in this mode? Okay, thanks. So you can see these are actually online and they're in Shodan now as well. So here's one of one that uh, we found online. Look at some information. The port that Guardian AST uses is port 10001. We're going to switch over and connect to it real quick just to show you that it's active and it runs the simple command. It's uh, the list inv inventory command, which pretty much dumps, tells you what the tank is, the volume, the height of the tank, the water content of the product, and the temperature of the tank. Oh, sorry. That also ran a second command, which was the, the shift report command. I forgot we did that one. Um, one thing to consider when we were looking at all these systems online was that not all tanks are created equal. As an example here, as you can see in this image, this one is actually um, has three biodiesel tanks. And in the next slide, you'll see that it's not just an underground tank. This one is actually a terminal station with large above ground tanks that they distribute this one to the individual or the stations that need it. Um, so other ones that we found also include, we found some backup generators online for like, data centers and hospitals uh, and the tanks that they have for those generators as well as gas stations as we talked. Um, there could be other tanks that you could use this for, I believe like if the cost wasn't restricted or so high on these things, you could probably get them for the people in the Northeast during the winter who have uh, heating fuels and stuff like that to help you maintain your inventory. But these things are really expensive for a consumer, in my opinion. I'm not going to spend $5,000 for something at my house. Um, so based off of Google Maps, the one that I just showed, which is in the town I live, which is Chattanooga, Tennessee, here's one. As you can see, there's a Love's truck at a station getting filled up from this company to take that to a Loves. So when we originally started looking at the, these, we were looking at uh, the uh, critical versus non-critical infrastructure. To me, this falls under uh, non-critical because it doesn't really control the pipelines. It doesn't do anything. It's at the gas stations or at the terminal stations, which is at the very end of that supply. Uh, so we wanted to specifically look versus when Kyle did his original ICS honeypot in 2013, which only focused on ICS. We were interested in looking at the non-critical ICS. And we wanted to see what happens and see if there was a tax towards the non-critical infrastructure as well. So when H.D. Moore in January published a, his report and findings around the Guardian ASTs, uh, Kyle and I sat down and, debate and talked about deploying and writing a custom honeypot to look like these devices. And so this one, we wrote a specific honeypot based off of uh, the Gate Guardian AST, which their Vita route was really nice and publishes their manuals. So that's how we wrote most of the code uh, for the, the honeypot itself was based off of the, the manuals and how they actually tell you what the response should look like in the manual. It was really nice. And we wanted to also create and better understand the actual attacks against the gas stations and gas tanks. And we really spun this off, and if you weren't paying it, in February, was it cut? Yeah, February, we released a blog about these devices, and we were monitoring Shodan in the original thing when we were going through it, and we noticed people were altering the tank names of some of the devices, and we published a blog 
about how we saw some one of them getting changed to we are legion which one could assume or construe that maybe with maybe uh, anonymous we're not going to so that was the original thing that spun us off to see okay we saw them being altered in the wild on real ones what if we deployed it and try to figure out who they were and see if they were trying to do other things than just the one thing, the one command that showed an indexes. So we wrote a single Python script that runs on any system. So it doesn't actually require any Vita roots, Guardian ASTs, or anything like that. It's just a script. And currently it accepts uh, input and output for six commands. The simple architecture behind it we tried to make it as minimalistic as possible to where the, there's few ports open, very little communication to it other than just if you're connecting to it, as it would be a true device. So what happens is if, if you're an attacker, you would connect to our script that we call GasPot. That GasPot then logs your connection and any commands or anything you do to it just logs it and then we retrieve those logs manually. We ended up deploying them, how many countries, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven countries, seven. Um, worldwide, trying to get, gain some very interesting attention. Um, a couple countries were not included or that we included this time that Kyle didn't do in his original ICS honeypots of uh, and that was Jordan mostly in UAE? That's correct, yep. And that was because we were trying to see, nobody has really looked into the Middle East to see if anything's going on in the Middle East for these things as well. So we specifically deployed those out um, in those regions to gain interest to see if anybody's doing anything with those. So we're going to go through a little bit of the code uh, behind GasPod itself to kind of give you an idea. We did a few interesting things and that makes it look different, that doesn't make it look like a t atypical honeypot that you see out there right now, especially for ICS. So in this ca case is a, it's the I-200. 20100 command itself, which is the list, I, the list tank uh, inventory command that we showed earlier. And what happens with that, as you can see, I was in, the, in that example is I'm writing out when somebody's connecting to it. That's all in GMT, so we can cross correlate the, the logs to see if there, somebody is doing multiples across a region, the world, or whatever. And then I send the information once upon it of the inventory of itself. So what we did, in this case, this shows the tank, the temperatures. What we did was we randomized as much as possible every time you run it. So you don't have to go in there and alter a bunch of stuff to make it look unique. So the, which is where a lot of honeypots fail out there right now is they statically use the same values over and over and over and over again. And now that Shodan is becoming more and more prevalent and people are looking at it, in my opinion, as a first level line of what to be interested in, you can start easily gauging honeypots because they all look exactly the same. So we tried to randomize as much as possible. And when we didn't have the ability to randomize it, we tried to add in, when we deployed them, individual specific information for the region in which we were deploying it. And sometimes we didn't, and it's still got some interesting results. So in Shodan, here's an, here is one that showed up in Shodan as one of our gas bots that was deployed. I literally said fuel company. <laughs> <laughs> it's real intuitive. Yeah. But there was no other ones that would say fuel company. Yeah, we made that happen, but we tried to gauge some of them to see if, you know, kind of dumb them down, make them look fairly simplistic as well. So, I mean, 
When we're coding it, you can also go in with just a simple change and change your product names. And we actually recommend you doing that. Um, just not for this one, but for other honeypots, change as much as possible. So with one change, we can change super to say we're going to deploy it in England. We'd call it petrol instead of super or something else specific to the region in which you're deploying it. Uh, the temperatures are in Fahrenheit, which you can then alter those as well to be in Celsius. So you want to change things based off of the location in which you're deploying. Not all of our instances were in Shodan that we deployed. We did this mainly to see if people were going to Shodan and paying attention to them from there or if they were discovering them through other means. Uh, whether, I mean, InMap has, has an InMap script that you can identify these now. Um, HD Moore Project Sonar is still scanning for them. Shodan scans for them. But there's other scanners out there that are looking for them. I think uh, PLC Scan out of China is looking at them too. And so, as an example, I mentioned earlier, we deployed some in Jordan. As you can see, there are no gas pots or Guardian ASTs found in Jordan. One of the reasons why we did this as well is to see kind of the growth behind how people were discovering them, what they would do to them if they weren't listed, to see if there was actually people out there actively looking for these that aren't just your normal curious person. So when we were starting to look at the actual results of the, the gas pot itself, there was a couple things we were considering when we were trying to classify the attacks. We did not have a port scan. So if we saw a port scan, we didn't classify that one as attack. We didn't classify an attack as somebody connecting to the device, but never doing anything. Uh, server fingerprinting, banner grabbing, we actually do consider, I uh, do, later have some information on. Um, some of this, the statistics of what we saw towards the do nothing and the gits as well because we did see gits and people not doing anything. As well as fat fingering, we didn't consider everything somebody typed as a unique special attack. What we did consider scans were successful commands resulting in a possible failure. Um, targeted malware, uh, de uh, denial of service, or distributed denial of service. Those were things we did consider as attacks before we actually started looking at the results. We kind of classified what we'd want to see and what we were going to immediately exclude from the, from the results. So it's kind of a base of what we did see. And Kyle's going to actually talk about what we did see. So <clears throat> to Stephen's point, a lot of what we were doing here was not only creating these honeypots as kind of an addition from, from the 2013 research that we were doing, but also because we were trying to understand who these attackers are and what the possible motivation is behind these attacks to non-critical infrastructure. We've done a lot of research as, as to who is attacking critical infrastructure, what we deem as critical infrastructure, and what their possible motivations are and possible attribution. And before I start to talk about some of these attacks and the attack statistics and, and some of the statistics behind banner grabbing, et cetera, keep in mind that I'm referring to attribution and I'm not saying we attributed based on IP address, we attributed based on code identifiers. Keep in mind that this is attribution based on the data that we have. So I'm not saying it's 100% this group or this actor, so don't go out and quote me and say, Kyle said it's North Korea. It's not the case. What are some possible attack scenarios? A common question that we continually kept asking ourselves was what exactly would an attacker do? And what's the motivation behind an attacker looking at these? We really kind of came up with four broad classifications of what attack scenarios would look like. First would be a denial of service or a, a distributed denial of service to the actual systems themselves causing supply chain disruptions. So for instance, if an attacker were to perform a denial of service against one of these pump monitoring systems, it could then cause gasoline not to be deployed to that specific gasoline pump. While that may not be that big of a problem with one pump, think about that in a region, 
right? Think about if these attackers were going and targeting a specific region in the United States or wherever for that matter, and they're deciding to stop supply chain within that region regarding gasoline. That could be a pretty big problem. Also, the changing of pump names. And whenever I say that, I'm referring to, if you remember back to the other screenshots of GasPod, it had unleaded, diesel, premium, etc. Changing those pumps and changing the values of what those pump names are can also cause some supply chain disruptions, right? It can cause incorrect um, unleaded fuel, for instance, to be dropped into um, premium unleaded, for instance. So that could really jack some things up. Also, changing the pumping volume, so in, uh, in essence, saying that the gas pumps themselves are full, whenever in actuality, they're empty, right? Which means there's no pump, there's no fuel within that system whatsoever. And on the end system, they're saying, okay, we're showing it's full, that could be a supply chain issue as well. And then finally, some sort of state-sponsored attack. We didn't really have anything founded in this, and there really wasn't any type of... Um, real data statistic that we had behind this, but realistically from a, from a state-sponsored aspect, individuals could be interested in this just from a pure data statistical standpoint, right? Just trying to understand what type of volume of gasoline is being produced and being outputted in a specific region, right? And again, that could be used for further targeting, further uh, informational analysis. So what did we see from an attack breakdown standpoint? Again, we have seven total deployed instances. We did. That's been changed, obviously, now because we're going live with this presentation. And a majority of those attacks, as we fairly expected, uh, were in the United States against honeypots that were specifically in the United States. One of the more interesting ones, however, is within Jordan. And we'll go into that in kind of the setup about uh, those specific honeypots in Jordan coming up. All in all, there were four attempted pump modifications. There were 12 identified pump identifications, meaning that attackers had gone out and purposely looked to see what was on that pump, what type of output was being generated, what type of names were being generated, what type of volume was there, etc. And then there were two ultimate denial of service attacks. And I'll get into some of the context and some of the details about that, because again, there is some ambiguity behind that. From an attack breakdown standpoint, this is kind of what we were seeing. So on the left-hand side, we have the country of origin, meaning where our honeypots are actually deployed or where they were. And along the top is the originator of those specific attacks. I'm not going to go into great detail other than one very interesting data point. And that's if you look at the Iranian column, um, and go down to the Jordanian honeypot. There were two attempted attacks, and I'm going to go into detail on that specific case study towards the end of the presentation to at least provide some context there. But that's an interesting one, and that drew our attention for multiple reasons, but one of the main ones is primarily because we were starting to wonder what about geopolitical and what type of political um, implications were involved there, right? There's obviously some tension within that region, so what was involved behind that to have this type of thing happen? And again, keeping in mind that this isn't necessarily critical infrastructure, so there's some complexities there as well. It's not like they were attempting to bring down a nuclear plant, right? From a connection attempt standpoint, this is just purely statistical. This, again, is not what we're classifying as an attack, so this, these are not being deemed as attacks. So for instance, on the enter command, that's literally someone telnetting to port 10001, hitting enter, expecting to get something back, and their connection dies. What this would traditionally be, what we were seeing, is what this would traditionally be attributed to, is someone going out doing a mass port scan across an entire slash 24 network, seeing port 10001 open, not knowing what it is, attempting to telnet it, and then have nothing else to go on. So they're really kind of very, uh, just kind of drive-by scanning, attempting to connect, and then popping out after that. That's it. And the same goes with help and get, right? They're attempting to run the get command, attempting to run the help command, to which it kills the connection, and there's really no data statistic provided back. So again, very likely individuals that haven't really done much as far as looking into these products, really understanding anything about these products, they're literally port scanning, connecting, and then dropping out. That's it. And we're including this just to give you an idea of how much interest, at least, that port 10001, regardless of what these individuals knew, 
how much interest there was in that specific port. From a valid command statistic standpoint, this is the rough breakdown. Um, the commands listed on the bottom are actual commands that GasPot will actually accept. Keep in mind that these commands are 100% accurate in regards to what the Vita root manual says. We literally took the Vita root manual, went through the actual, um, the actual command sets, implemented that into our script. That way, if individuals were going out and attempting to interact, then they were able to at least be presented back with dynamic information, as, as Stephen had mentioned. I was going to say one thing about this was there is the six commands that are implemented. They, they have a lot more implemented. We took the subset of commands that we thought would be most interesting and most likely be able to run. To run. As you can see, we saw most of them and some of the design... Uh, design around GasPod itself was you get a valid error back if you do not enter one of these commands. It is a valid error from the manual as well. So if you entered another command that's not supported, you would get an error message as if it was an actual Vita root that just didn't have that command. Yeah, exactly. And so for instance, the I20100 command is a query for gas pump names. That's all it is. It's literally a, an individual telnetting in, committing this command, and getting back the gas pump names. What this is telling us at this point, and the reason that we were gathering this data statistic, is because that tells us how much information these individuals at least understood about these systems. Because let's face it, if I were to go out and telnet to a device on a non-standard port that I didn't know, I wouldn't attempt to run I-20100. It means nothing to me, right? So these specific individual attempts to connect we're truly attempting to connect based on these devices because they knew and they fingerprinted them as 10,001 and they issued that command. So from an attack statistic standpoint, we thought it would be interesting to compare the critical infrastructure honeypots that I spoke about in 2013 at Black Hat and non-critical infrastructure honeypots, which is what we're considering this research. Over the time in 2013, I had deployed those in eight different countries in 12 different deployment locations throughout those countries, and there were 74 total attacks in an entire year. With this specific instance, with GasPot and looking at non-critical infrastructure, we deployed these in seven countries with a total of 10 different deployments, some countries having additional deployments, the US being one of those locations, with 18 total attacks over six months. So you can see the attack statistic is not as high as what you would maybe consider. We have some theories behind that, but those are just theories. We really, we don't have anything concrete, meaning I haven't gone out and interviewed somebody that connected to these and said, why are you not going after, or why are you attacking these and not critical infrastructure or something? I'd like to do that, so if any of you have connected to any of these devices over the past six months, please come talk to me so we can get some more context around this. So right now, all I'm showing on this specific slide, yeah, if the video, I just gave away my Eddie Murphy slide. That's a shame. <laughs> okay, well, that specific video is not being friendly. What that video was is us literally just connecting with Kali into a gas pot instance locally, and that's all we were doing, and issuing the I-20,100 20, command. That's all we were doing. The Eddie Murphy slide is the best slide in the entire deck, um, <laughs> just because it's, it's good. And what realistically I'm gonna jump into now is intelligence behind who the attackers possibly could have been. Again, with the caveat that attribution is only as good as the data we have, right? We're, we're, I'm not going to sit here and make claims as to who they certainly are. I'm going to present the data, and based on the data that we have, say who it possibly could be. So please keep in mind that caveat. Before I really get into that, I want to kind of profile one specific group. And I know a lot of us have heard about them, and I know a lot of us have heard specifics about the specific group SEA, or Syrian Electronic Army. This particular group had started in 2010, early 2011. Um, they support, at that time, the president um, of Syria. And this specific actors are kind of what you would consider 
for lack of a better term, script kitties. They perform uh, denial of services, website defacements, malware distribution, information sharing on underground forums, um, and just quote unquote general mischief in general. They've been fairly well known as far as defacing uh, fairly well known media sites, NPR, CBS, Associated Press, Al Jazeera, etc. And they're traditionally going after those types of environments to make a political statement of some sort. Whenever we were going out and we were looking at a specific attack against one of our honeypots in Washington, D.C., we started to realize that there was a tremendous amount of traffic, and by tremendous I'm saying on these devices it was a surprising amount for us, for what we had been seeing in the past. In total there was a denial of service, a distributed denial of service based on multiple IPs, which I'll provide you in the next slide. And it was, it was performed over two days, and it was again provided and performed on a gas pot instance deployed within Washington, D.C. In the last statement here where I'm saying it appears to be utilizing low orbit ion cannon, which is a very well known script kitty friendly tool that is extraordinarily lame, but very effective. And the way that we had kind of come possibly to the attribution of that was simply by the message after the get command, which is SEA can go. From that, we then started to correlate based on multiple IPs with three of the primary offenders being listed here. Those specific IPs have had activity tied to the Syrian Electronic Army over the past three years, and the past year has been really fairly active. The interesting thing about this, however, is the Syrian Electronic Army always makes a point to publicly disclose their operations and to publicly disclose and say, look what we're doing, we're defacing ABC, we're going after NPR, etc. Nothing has been disclosed of any sort by this group about any of this. Reasoning behind that, we don't know. And again, this is just our best attempt at attribution. It may not be these guys. We don't know. It could just be a false flag effort, right? They could just be piping compromised boxes and putting traffic through those compromised boxes in Syria and then move on with life. We don't know. We're only provided with the information we have. So that's the first attack that we kind of case studied out and kind of looked at from an intelligence standpoint. The second, if you remember, in the slide showing the attack breakdown, is an attack against our Jordanian honeypots. Keep in mind as well that <clears throat> with these honeypots, we didn't just go out and buy Amazon EC2 instances in those countries and deploy these gas pot instances because any attacker, or anybody for that matter, would be able to very quickly see it's on an Amazon instance. That's obvious at that point that it's someone deploying something on a virtual IP on an Amazon instance. So we purchased IP space locally within the country to deploy them to give it at least the, the idea that those IP spaces and that specific IP was owned by the organization running these pumps. The Iranian Dark Coders is a group primarily operating, a group of attackers primarily operating outside of Iran. They're pro-Iranian, so they're pro-government um, within Iran. And similar to the SEA, they primarily work on website defacements, denial of service attacks, information sharing, and they're fairly active in malware distribution as well. And they're also known to be doing quite a bit in the hacktivism space. The specific group of, the group that we think is performing one of these attacks was a specific attempt to modify the pumps themselves. The attacks came from four primary IPs listed here, and they modified pump names. Again, with the caveat that from an attribution standpoint, we don't know necessarily if this could be a false flag. Again, they could be actors from outside of that area piping through compromised boxes. An interesting point, and the next question most of you will probably ask is, well, where did you come up with that idea that it's IDC? Well, it's pretty apparent. They modified pump number one to say hacked by IDC team. Okay, at that point, I had been following the IDC team for a little bit, so I had at least recognized that to some degree. I had to go refresh myself, and I said, okay, well that's interesting. We checked another one within Jordan, the second deployed instance within Jordan, and you can see that pump number one on that specific pump, our gas pot instance, was deleted, and pump name number three was modified with Ahad was here. 
And at that point I said, okay, I don't recognize that. I don't know what a hod is here, is about. So I went out and did a little Google search for a hod was here, and I was presented with that. Which if you look at the bottom it says a hod was here. And this was off of a compromised web page, uh, web page de de defacement, and then we started to correlate those lines and say, okay, well this is fairly interesting because we now know that at least IDC, a hot is a member of IDC, probably working in tandem to some regard. And you know, we can then start to say that might be an attribution case. Some other interesting notes about this. Ahad um, lists that he hacks, he hack hacks, we've hacking hacking. I don't know what that means, but he's involved in hacking in some regard. And he kind of lists out, and this is within his profile within IDC's forum. Another interesting point is that IDC has started over the past, over the past year realistically, become very interested in SCADA environments, SCADA ports, SCADA infrastructure, how protocols work, um, and all of those kind of uh, rare information chunks, right? Stuff that a generic individual wouldn't necessarily know. And this is just a screenshot of a specific individual. This is not AHA. This was another individual on the IDC board um, that's trading SCADA information. If you go out to their actual forum, you can start to see they're becoming very active in SCADA malware interest as well as uh, just generic SCADA information. So again, those are the only two case studies we're going to really cover in the talk, primarily again because we're still digesting that information. And we've expanded the actual GasPot project and the GasPot instances a little bit further out worldwide. So what we're going to do as of today is I'm releasing, or we're releasing, um, the actual code for GasPot. Uh, provided here's the GitHub link you can get to it, as well as a Google URL shortened version of it if you, for the too long didn't read person, person out here. So what, I, what you can do with this is go through the code, you can review the code, you can run the code on your own and have your own gas pot instance running out there and it'll log it locally and you can see if some interesting, if anyone's out there looking for stuff in your region. Um, there's some coding caveats that I would recommend changing, as I mentioned before, some of the things specific to your regions. Or you can run it default, but it randomizes values, but there's only about 10 station names. So you can add to them, delete from it. Uh, every time you run it, it will like, it randomizes even that station name, it randomly chooses it out of the array. So if you want to be one specific one, remove it. And there's ones that have multiple lines as an example. I kind of dumbed down the ones that we were using specifically and didn't put them in there. Minus the fuel company one. <laughs> um, so some of the ones we were running aren't included. As I said, we kind of altered some of them to be region specific to see if that got any attention as well. So those aren't in there so you can't look at my code and go find ours on, on Shodan. Also keep in mind that if anybody is actively wanting, if anybody makes active changes to the code, et cetera, let us know because it would be interesting to see what people change and see what people find valuable out of the code. That would also be beneficial for us. So with a lot of, a lot of design we went into to make it look like uh, no honeypot is out there that I know of right now. Um, it looks very much like a Guardian AST. Uh, the only thing I would do is add more commands, but I know didn't see any ones of interest, but that may be something we'll add in the future. Continue the growth of it to make it look more and more and more and more like a Guardian AST. And the hopes is that with the releasing honeypots like this, people should know that they're out there and question if you're connecting to a real one or a honeypot. With that, we left enough information or enough time um, at the end for any questions um, that anybody may have. So the question was, what was the period of time in which we were running these honeypots, and were any of them malicious? Um, 
the time frame in which we were running this was primarily mostly in 2015. Um, it realistically started, when did we start this? In late February. Fe late February, roughly. Um, up until um, we started to ch change um, about um, two weeks ago, I yeah. guess, be two weeks. Um, from a malicious standpoint, I, I think it depends on what your term or what you're defining as malicious. Well, you can't overfill a tank. The only thing, yeah, the only thing you can do is change the the tank diameters to make it look like it's always full. Uh, we did not see any of those types of commands. Now, when they're changing the tank name, as we showed in that one example, that's not publicly known that the command, it's not well known, it's not the one HD Moore has released or anything like that about the command itself. So somebody read the manual to figure out how to change the tank name. I mean, so, based off of some basic understanding of those, you would try, because we listed, showed you the I-20,100 command. That command lists all tanks. Now, if you try to set a tank name with the S, which is set uh, 60200, so 6200 uh, command, that will change all the tanks to one name. So you have to iterate through them. So they knew enough to change the first tank and the third tank. Also keep in mind that this could be a precursor, right? Oftentimes what we'll see with these types of things, and, and this was also relevant in the 2013 research that I was doing uh, regarding critical infrastructure, this could be a precursor for further attacks at a later date. So they might have been profiling these environments to then go back at a later date and start to affect, et cetera. They might have just been querying these as a first kind of reconnaissance attempt and then going later on to do um, additional attacks or, or additional malicious um, activities. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, not a lot. <laughs> so, so certain Vita root, I'm sorry? Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, yeah. The question was what is being done um, on these devices to prevent these types of attacks outside of lack of knowledge about the command? The answer is unfortunately not much. There are certain Vita root products that allow a four digit pin to be entered Keeping in mind that that pin is numeric only, values one through nine, or no, zero through nine, zero it includes nine. zero. Um, <laughs> sorry, big difference. Um, and it's actually a physical dial that you have to change it on. Yeah, yeah, it's a physical dial, um, and that, yeah. <laughs> and keep in mind that by default that is not enabled. So we'll, we're often, or we've been getting asked, have we notified Vita Root of this issue? <laughs> and it's, it's, we're in a catch-22 because it's kind of like that's the way it's designed. They're aware of it, um, that it's, in my opinion, a design flaw. Um, and, you know, there are limited aspects of, again, like PIN, et cetera, that are available, but they're not enabled by default, and they're not enabled on every single product that they offer, unfortunately. Much, much like most of your industrial control system equipment <laughs> out there, there's no authentication, there's no encryption. The original design behind these wasn't to go hang them off on the internet. So uh, that's why you see, uh, to me, a prevalency of these in the US, is because we really like to just toss it out on the internet and make it as automated as possible so the tanks don't get empty and have to call somebody and so on and so forth. So. But it, 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 this device itself speaks a lot to the same issues that all your other industrial control system devices have as well. I mean, yeah, you, you can go if you, it doesn't. I mean, it's, it's the same thing that we're facing in just in the broad industrial control system uh, security realm anyway, which is these devices need to have some security built into them, um, an authentication more than a four-digit PIN, uh, user privilege, or just, and even to the point where these should be not hung out on the internet 
you should have to VPN to it to connect to it so you can limit the, the number of people who can actually get to the device as well. And in my opinion, I mean, it really comes down to the fact that this is an implementation fail on a lot of regards because they shouldn't be deploying this on the internet, right? Plain and simple. Like, take it off the internet. That at least lowers the risk profile by some degree. So the question was, are in the logging scheme of GasPot, does it also log other commands that are issued? Yes, it will. Anything you type in, enter after your initial connection, it'll log it. So we did look through the logs to see if there was any other valid attempts that I was not accepting. And, and you know, as I said earlier, it would produce an error to the end user. But we did not see anything outside of those six commands I implemented. But as more people g gain aware of this, realize the manuals are out there, can read through them, can find other interesting commands, it's possible. The ground. <laughs> yeah, so most tanks are in the, in, so the question is why between 50 and 60 degrees? And the reason, rationale behind that was your tanks are in the ground. And that's the range in which you can, depending on the soil, how far down it is and, and where it's deployed. Yeah. I mean, it may be a little warmer, but honestly, how many people are going to be like, huh, that temperature is just a little too warm for that region? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the question was, with the denial of service that was performed, did it appear targeted or did it appear to be just happenstance? There's a few things to that. Um, in my opinion, we don't have any indicators to show it was targeted whatsoever. None. The IPs were sequential for the most part, which makes it seem as those boxes were working in tandem. Unfortunately, we didn't have any other boxes deployed in the same subnet that we could watch a concurrent uh, a DDoS across this whole entire slash 24, for instance. So we don't know necessarily if it was targeted or not. We just know that the end result was the system going offline, which on the scale of ICS, SCADA, world, and environment, unfortunately, a majority of the time, these attacks don't have to be targeted to have a massive outage or a massive issue. So the end result is what is a concern in my opinion versus is it targeted? But that's a very valid question and I wish, looking back, that's something that we're starting to modify the research on is deploying concurrent boxes in the same subnet to be able to watch if there's you know, uh, uh, an entire slash 24, for instance, being attacked. But good question. Um, so I don't have that number on hand, to be honest. Um, we started to see a degradation of service at right at about one. Um, but the minimum amount, I don't know, unfortunately. I can't, I can't say. Sorry. Great. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we're going to be around all week, so if you have any questions, feel free to rest. <laughs>